So, like, hundreds of you have, over the last few weeks, whenever I've said, what should I make a video about? Um, replied with Sylvan. <laughs> what happened to Sylvan? What about Sylvan? Tell us about Sylvan. So today I thought I might talk about Carter. Just kidding. <laughs> Tell you about Sylvan. Um, or at least my vision of Sylvan and what I think about his past and his future. So here we go. So Sylvan Cassell, what is there to say? Dreamy blue eyes, wavy brown hair, tawny skin. I mean, what's not to like, right? But in fact, a completely complicated character. I think we can all agree. It's funny because when I started writing Night School, I'd read a lot of YA. And in fact, I've done a video about the books that sort of influenced my writing. But in all of them, I mean, love trilogies were a thing. They were such a thing. And I still like them, sorry. I still like them, not in everything, and I wouldn't put them in everything, but in Night School, for me, it, it was probably strongly influenced by how many young adult books I read had them. And that tug of the different, tug and pull of the different, like, emotions on someone's heart, especially when they're quite young and when they're just meeting people for the first time, because Ali comes into Night School and she hasn't known anybody very long when it all just, like, she doesn't know Sylvan, she doesn't know Carter. She hasn't had time to get to know who's good and who isn't, or if they're both good or not. And in all the books I'd read, so many of them, there was a good guy and a bad guy, although in Twilight there were two great guys, um, <clears throat> allegedly, um, although none of us really loved the werewolf. Did we? Oh, sorry, if you loved the werewolf, I apologize, but I just thought he was a bit wet in the British parlance. Um, usually there was a good guy and a bad guy, and the bad guy was super bad, and eventually the character figured out that he was super bad and went with a good guy. And that was never my intention. I was going to do precisely the opposite. I was going to write a good guy and a bad guy, and then eventually have her fall for the bad guy, and have the bad guy be nuanced, and so good and bad within him. Like a good heart, but bad education, if you can get my drift. That's how I viewed Sylvan when I started, but it became, he became, something different along the way. It was really fascinating to me because what he became in my mind was a really good guy from a good family who was just spoiled rotten and he'd forgotten or never learned how to accept no. Like nobody had ever told him no. There's a scene in Resistance where his dad's like in an accident and it's a bad accident and they don't know if he's gonna make it and Sylvan just suddenly is Sylvan the billionaire's kid and he says to Isabel get my plane tell you know what who to call get it ready and you know and then he just turns to walk out of the room like he's that guy at 17 he can tell his head mistress he can order her to get his plane and she does like when you were raised like that how do you not become spoiled and self-indulgent I'm just not sure it's possible. I think it would take such good parenting to avoid it. So that was sort of the way I approached it. A good guy, an only child of a billionaire, spoiled by his upbringing and the sheer wealth at his fingertips. So I see his upbringing as incredibly privileged, very similar really to Joe's, in that he would have gone to the Samaria equivalent in France up until he came to Samaria, which I think he'd done probably when he was 14. 13 or 14 in my mind was when he would have come over. Maybe even a little younger, maybe 12. Because I have this theory, and I've always had it, and you can kind of see it in book one, that he and Carter had been friends when they were younger. So let's say maybe 12, 13, 14. So basically, little boys, they were, they were best friends in my mind. And knowing Carter's background, so he's a scholarship kid, he's an orphan, he's there by sort of chance and raised by the groundkeeper and Isabel in a way and the other teachers have always looked out for him, but he has nothing really technically, although we all know they're going to take care of him, he will always be fine and he's getting this amazing education for free, like they are doing their best for him and they really care about him. But Sylvan has never experienced anything in terms of loss until his father's accident. So he, and until Allie, really. So he has always been the golden boy. He's just been on this smooth uphill um, ski ride of um, ease. So I can imagine when they got to be 14, 15, when 
boys develop their own girls to develop their own true natures and personalities. You see Carter becoming more philosophical, reading more philosophical books. I always like he meant, I think he reads Salinger in book one, I believe he does. So he's seeking sort of philosophical and spiritual guidance and Sylvan's just rich, right? So he's kind of going in a different direction. He's becoming more self-indulgent. He's beautiful so girls fall for him from the beginning he's loaded so he can buy anything he wants his parents dote on him so he feels like superman so he goes in a very different direction that can really change you you can start out kids are kids right whether they've got money or don't have money they're just kids but when you get to be a teenager a young adult that's when you're becoming the adult you're going to be and that's when I feel like he went a different direction. He, he became more spoiled, more indulgent. And I imagine he and Carter fell out over his treatment of girls. And I've always thought that the things that people told Allie about Carter were lies. I mean, I've always just believed that, that it was designed to push her to Sylvan. I've never believed what they said about Carter was true. We never see any evidence of that, that he, he, dumps girls or jilts girls or is mean to them. I've always thought the truth behind that is shown by his behavior. And that is that he couldn't pretend to like a girl just, just for sex or for whatever sort of ego boost that one gets from that when one doesn't really like somebody that I think he really did. He does say to Ali that if he doesn't feel something on like the third date, then he knows it's not real and then he would break up. And that often was taken very badly by the girl, which I can completely get um, on both sides. Both sides, I think, in that are understandable. Whereas Sylvan choosing a new girl every year to sort of seduce in some way or another and then dump, usually a young girl. Well, that, that also makes sense in terms of his character. To me, that makes sense in terms of his becoming more jaded because now he's 16 and people fawn over him because of his money and girls fall for him because of his looks and money and who his family is and that can make you really cynical very early. I have known some quite wealthy young men. I grew up with no money but I grew up in a rich neighborhood in Houston and so in my high school like we were <laughs> I was the poor kid and we weren't that poor but we were the poorest like we were known. It was known that we lived in the only apartment complex in the entire school district, like that was us. And I knew how the other kids lived and the super rich among them were often the most jaded, or at least among them, there were some who quickly became very, very cynical and very, like not abusive, but just testing to see what they could get away with all the time. Can I burn this down? Will I go to jail? No, huh, thought not. Can I wreck this car? Um, will I get into trouble? No, thought not and so on. And so I wanted to play around with what that does to a young person's mind. But also with him, the thing that differentiates him from somebody who becomes a, basically a psychopath like Gabe is that when he is told no, when he loses Ali, when he loses what he wanted, he becomes a better person. He learns from that. Instead of becoming more bitter, he does try harder to become a good person. He sees what good is. He sees Carter and Ellie and Rachel, and he wants to be like that. He and Katie lesser, to a lesser extent, Katie is the same, that they see these people working so hard and they, they get it. They do get it, both of them, and they want to be part of that. And they, they, they understand what goodness is. They then want to be good. They want for themselves something that their parents didn't know how to ask of them. And so to be able to do that is to overcome the, the privileges of their upbringing. And so that's why when people are extremely disdainful of Sylvan because of what he does in book one, I often say to them, the Sylvan in book four and the Sylvan in book one are extremely different people. The Sylvan in book one, she should never have dated. The Sylvan in book four, I would forgive her for falling in love with. And so that is, my take on like why I stand up for Sylvan despite what happens in book one. That is, that is his journey. He's got to go on this journey to become a good man. He's going to have to learn how to do it himself. We all kind of have to do that. We have to decide at a certain age, am I going to be a good person? Or am I going to be just a rich person? Or am I going to be just a, an abusive person? And, and we see people take those different paths. I want us to be able to see the journey they choose and to believe it, 
it has to make sense. And with Sylvan, to me, it made perfect sense that he became a good person. But the question then remains, what happens after he really loses Ali? What happens after the end? Because uh, lots of people have been horrified that he leaves without ever them ever having a rapprochement. They don't make up, they don't find a way for her to say to him without hurting him that she just wants to be his friend for life or that she thinks she should be his friend for life. They never have that moment. They have that brief conversation um, on a, in a very stressful time and then he's gone, he goes. I get it, I get that people want that moment but Sylvan is now nearly 18 in Endgame. He's been through absolute wars. His father is paralyzed. His family needs him. And he's a good guy, but he's not a saint. And his heart is broken. And I do not think that that Sylvan, that he's still somebody who can have anything he's want, he wants. He's still a guy who can call a limousine to come pick him up, to take him to his plane, and go anywhere in the world to get away from what he doesn't want to watch. So I did not believe he would stick around to have those conversations again. I just didn't think he'd want more of that. I think he would go. He would just walk. And after that, because I get asked a lot, what do I think became of him? And I don't want to say too much because Sylvan will appear in the number 10 trilogy. And I don't want to, to give away too much. I think he will have recovered. We all recover. When we are 24, we are rarely still thinking about the 17-year-old um, that we, we loved back when we were also 17. So I don't believe, personally, that he has spent the last six or seven years allowing himself to think about Ali. Like, I think he's got way too much discipline for that. He would have focused on what he needs to do to run his father's business, what he has to do to help his family, what he's got to do within Demeter, the, the European organization, and to help Isabel long distance. He will have encountered her, and sometimes they are, their paths would have crossed. And I think those, those meetings would have been tense, in a way, as they often are with exes. Sometimes we blame the person our relationships didn't work out with, even when there's no reason to blame them, because we need to blame somebody. So I think he will have some anger that he can't quite explain or really justify, but it's normal, unfortunately, for people to go through a time of, of like anger after a relationship doesn't work out. And I think he has a bit of, a bit of that a bit of you led me on, even though she never did. They both led each other on, and they both still care about each other. And in fact, there is unfinished business between them. I think we can all agree with that, at least. Like, there's definitely a problem there, like, th that they could never quite overcome, or not a problem so much as a, a loss that they both feel. So, I will write it in number 10 or number 11 in the second book in the number 10 series because they don't, it, neither of them much appears in, in book one. It's two and three where we will see old, more old friends. So I, um, I'm gonna play around with that. So I don't wanna, don't wanna paint myself into a corner here because I haven't yet decided how it's going to go. I am winging this one. So you'll just have to wait and read the new series and I will have to wait and write it and then we'll know for sure what happens afterwards. Tell me below in the comments what you think? What do you think about Sylvan? Is he a good guy or a bad guy in the end? Is he gonna ever get over Ali? Will she get over him? Have they gotten over each other? Is the love triangle finally complete? What do you think? Tell me below and come back next week uh, for more exciting chit chat. <laughs>